you all very, very, very much. I'm going to turn this on and probably turn this off. Can you all? Oh boy, you can hear me. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you guys very, very much. Uh, the, the hospitality of Missouri to an Illinois boy has uh, been awesome uh, here at uh, Emily and, and Brian and uh, uh, all of you. And, uh, and we spent a couple days at the uh, Historical Society uh, facility looking at the E.B. Trail collection, which I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, but anyhow, I, this is truly an honor to be here today and to, and to be invited in the first place. And what I'm going to talk about are, are steamboats that were uh, built in Metropolis, Illinois. Uh, as an architect, uh, I was doing work at the Carroll Public Library in Carroll, Illinois, which is a, a very, very old facility, and, uh, and has a lot of uh, has a special collections as an architect. That's what I was involved in with their special collections. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I was hoping that, uh, that my slides would be brighter. I've never seen them this big <laughs> <laughs> on a screen before, so they're usually, the projector is usually closer. So. But uh, the, this boat that's, that's uh, right uh, whoop, back up. Oh, it went all the way to the end. Um, this boat right here is called the City of Cairo. Uh, it uh, was built in the city of Metropolis. I grew up in Metropolis, went all through high school, uh, went off to college. Uh, it wasn't until 25, 30 years later as a practicing architect that I ever had any idea that the boats were built in Metropolis. And uh, at all, and it was working at the Carroll Library that I found this picture with this note on the back, built at Metropolis, Illinois. Uh, these are other boats that were built at Metropolis. How I uh, got started on this research was because I wasn't a historian. I, I, I'm still not a historian. I don't have a PhD in history. Uh, but I am a researcher and I've been involved in historic preservation uh, of buildings uh, for a number of years. But the city of Metropolis didn't know about this either. And there was going to be a reenactment down the Ohio River, the 200th anniversary of the first steamboat down the Ohio, the New Orleans that came from Pittsburgh down towards Cairo uh, and, and on down to New Orleans in 1811. And they were recreating that. So uh, I talked to the tourism folks at Metropolis and and the people at Fort Massac, the state park, and, it's, and they organized a, uh, uh, an event to recognize that and to prepare for it for uh, uh, a couple of months before the event. We had uh, 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 research days at the public library at Fort Massac, at the Brookport Public Library, where people, uh, they, we had newspaper articles and they brought their materials in and we could scan them and share it back with them. And so we learned a whole lot. This is, this is what it is today. Uh, at the top here is the, the Bell of Louisville, which um, you saw little video clips of that uh, uh, earlier uh, before the program started. This is the Bell of Cincinnati, which was the other boat that you saw there. This is the steamboat Natchez in New Orleans, which is a modern, all steel design. Uh, a boat that doesn't have overnight passengers. It's basically an excursion boat, a dinner boat around New Orleans. Uh, this, is, this is what we have today. This is all that's left. But this is why it's all important, why, why this happened in the first place. This is a map from the Army Corps of Engineers of the inland waterway system from New Orleans to Cairo, Carroll to Pittsburgh, Carroll to Minneapolis, to St. Louis, out to Kansas City, uh, back over to, down the Tennessee Valley uh, TVA system down to Mobile. And, and then there's an inland water waste system along Texas. But this area that I'm going to talk about tonight is right here. It's called the Crescent of the Ohio. And it's one 48-mile length of water that connects this entire system together. It's a very center. It's like a, a the knot in a, in a bow of shoestrings. So uh, this is what we're going to be talking about. 
Now, uh, I'm almost going to have to stand down somewhere else here uh, so I can read it. But, but the Crescent know how here's Pittsburgh, here's Carroll, St. Louis, New Orleans, Minneapolis, and out to Missouri, was, was kind of the bus station, the interchange of, of several major migrations after the first one. The first migration from Europe, all you know, centered on the East Coast, all east of the Appalachian Mountains. But the second migration came down the Ohio, came across you know, overland too. But the fastest way was to take the interstate highway at that time, which was the Ohio River and then the, the Mississippi. Uh, and then the third migration was uh, during the, the gold rush and the opening up of the, of the West. Oops. Okay. All right. So here's here's the the, the uh, crescent of the Ohio River. Oh, I'm, I'm pushing the button. It's for laser, and I'm pushing and changing. This is the an early map, an 1890s map of what was the United States. The United States in the 18 or, or the 1790s just went to the Mississippi River. This was all Virginia. What's now Kentucky and Tennessee was really Virginia. Everything above the Ohio River out to Mississippi was the Northwest Territory, and this was the Louisiana Purchase. At the center of that crescent, uh, this 48-mile stretch of river, uh, was Fort Massac. Fort Massac was settled settled by the by the French earliest in 1756. Now this area that is described as army area was established at the end of the Revolutionary War for soldiers who, who couldn't get paid. Uh, uh, they, they opted to get paid in land instead. There were several federal, federal reserves around. But, but actually, this was New France uh, uh, even earlier when the, when the French Indian War occurred. Uh, and the, the French were, had, to, were, had to leave the Montreal area, had to leave Pittsburgh area. Many of them came down the Ohio River. But even before that, in 1700, the French came out of Montreal down the, uh, uh, through the Great Lakes, down the Illinois River, down the Mississippi, and they set up a tannery right at this area called La Bosch. Now, Spain had this territory, everything across the across the, uh, the Mississippi River. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm using a rant, something I'm not familiar with here. Uh, but, well, all right, so one more time. Uh, this is George Rogers Clark who uh, uh, was the general, uh, with General Washington, that his role was to come out down the Ohio and move the French and the British out of this Illinois territory. And at first he came to Fort Massac, and Massac was completely gone by that time, about the, the 1780s, uh, right after the Revolutionary War. And then, uh, <clears throat> then he moved over to Fort Kaskaskia on the, on the Mississippi, and then back over to Fort Ben Sands. And that bit pretty much clearly claimed this Northwest Territory for the United States. And this is a recreation of Fort Massac at that time. First it was French, uh, then it kind of basically disappeared, rotted away, and went into the ground, the French left. And then the British came by, we're going to establish something, and he didn't spend time to do it. And then by this, uh, uh, the 1790s, uh, the American government uh, built a fort. Okay, the the at the, in the at, right at the turn of the century, at, say eighteen hundreds, eighteen hundred. Uh, only the Ohio River had been mapped by the United States government because everything, uh, the Mississippi was really the western edge of the United States. But in 1796-97 area, 
uh, uh, surveyors came down the Ohio and surveyed all the way to Cairo, what is now, wasn't Cairo then, but to the confluence of the Ohio. And then they surveyed down the Mississippi, and then they went up the Mississippi and uh, towards uh, St. Louis. But this was basically the end of the United States at that time. And then 17 or 1803, we have Jefferson uh, uh, giving the directions to Meriwether Lewis and, and Clark to, to go out to, uh, to find the route to the west. And so we had the, we had the uh, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, Corps of Discovery. Fort Massac was important at that time as well because as Lewis and Clark came down the river, they needed men. And they picked up a number of uh, volunteers at Fort Massac. They, they came down from, uh, from Pittsburgh down the Ohio, downstream, all down river, a lot easier to do. They got to Fort Massac, picked up Drew Liard, who was a scout, and several other men. And then they floated down to the confluence uh, with the Mississippi and realized, oh my gosh, that river's going the wrong direction. <laughs> Water's flowing south. And so they needed a lot more men. They finally pulled their boat, portaled and poled, and uh, just manhandled those boats up to uh, Fort Kaskaskia, picked up some more men, and then they went up to, uh, uh, to near Alton, uh, uh, Hartford, Illinois, actually, right across the river from, uh, from where the Missouri runs into Mississippi. And they set up camp for the winter and tried to figure out, okay, made their plans to do all that. But while they were at Carroll, because that was the last place mapped, that's the last place there were coordinates, uh, uh, longitude and latitude of coordinates on, on the entire uh, United States, they created their first map. Jefferson wanted to, wanted to know how big was the Ohio? How much water flowed by there at a particular time? How big was the Mississippi? And they, with their surveying skills, uh, uh, mapped that whole area. And then that map went back to Philadelphia. And other mappers then took all the information that Lewis Clark would send them and create the other maps that, that were more familiar with with the Lewis and Clark expedition. But Fort Massac was very, very important in that process. The, uh, the, some of the instruments that Lewis and Clark used are, are on display. We managed to, uh, to, to find a, a, a collector of instruments using the grant from the Library of Congress to Southern Illinois University. Uh, we developed a, a series of uh, uh, events around uh, Metropolis and at, at Cairo and in other locations on the river. And developed a, a museum exhibit that is at the Custom House at Carroll. And these instruments that you see here, this, the sextant, which is this instrument. Uh, this is a, an octant here, I think just another view of the octant. This is the museum display, which is one of the, one of the finer displays at any of the Lewis and Clark uh, locations. But this is what it looked like at that Lewis and Clark time. This is the way people got around. Uh, uh, small boats called the Mackinac. Uh, the upper right is is a small barge or the flat boat. Do we see this? This being the flat boat, that being the barge. And this is a, a later view, but basically it was it was except for the steamboats. This is what the confluence at Cairo, the Ohio and the Mississippi River, right here, looked like in 1800. By 1841, there was still pretty much not much there. This is a, a flat boat that uh, we excavated uh, up, up River of Carroll, one of the only flat boats that's ever been uh, discovered. Most flat boats uh, ended up stranded on a gravel bar somewhere, and then if the river didn't rise soon, the people on the boat dismantled it and built a house. Uh, and that's where they, they, they ended up living. If they made it to New Orleans, they took the boats apart and built the shotgun houses we're familiar with today. Up. 
This is a, a view, of, a, a, a drawing of uh, near above uh, Fort Benton, and, and it was uh, it's just a beautiful drawing, but it shows basically how people were getting around at that pre-steamboat time. 1811, first steamboat built west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, they, were, they were experimenting building some boats on, the, on the Fulton and others were doing that on the Hudson River in New York. But to get across the Appalachian Mountains and, and to think about going down the Ohio all the way to New Orleans, uh, that had never been done before. And so uh, these are sketches of the two types of boats that they thought you know, historians later a stern wheeler or a side wheeler, they finally realized that stern wheelers weren't really created until later, and this is a, a recreation of a boat, a side wheeler, that in uh, 1911 uh, went from, recreated that, that, uh, that trip to New Orleans. Some of the earliest boats, and so up at the top we have 1811 New Orleans, the Comet 1812, the Vesuvius 14. They're just, you know, eight or ten boats that were created just in that nine year period before uh, 1820. Uh, well, that's not true because I've got something here that says 60 steamboats had been constructed uh, by that time. But they're, the, the boats that we hear about or have read about are, the, are those particular boats. But they had, they had big V hulls, a hull, I'm gonna sketch it right here, a hull that's shaped <laughs> like this, uh, because they didn't really think about the Ohio River going up and down. The, the, the Hudson River was very deep, and, uh, and they didn't have problems with, uh, and their boats were designed a little more like ocean going or Hudson River boats. Back up here, sorry. Uh, the Zebulon Pike was one of those early boats, and it made it to St. Louis in 1817. It finally, you know, was able to, to get enough power and, and uh, pressure, uh, paddle wheel power, to make it up uh, up the Mississippi as far as uh, as St. Louis. The earliest boat in New Orleans, it, it, when it finally got to New Orleans, it couldn't get back as far as Natchez, and so it ended up staying in that area. The first stern wheeler was created in about 1830, and this is a sketch uh, that uh, that a, a man, uh, Frederick Ways, who's a, a steamboat guy, who is probably one of one of the key people in all of our anybody's research related to steamboats, because he he kept track of uh, and found information on approximately 8,700 steamboats that had built since the beginning. So he, he knew what he was talking about. What I'm going to talk about the most tonight is the, the relationship between the area that I come from, the metropolis down on the Crescent, and St. Louis and, and the Missouri River uh, trade as far as out to Fort Bend. And, uh, and, and kind of to, before I start with that, the French were out here trapping and, and uh, hunting uh, way back, even, even the, the 1700s. Uh, but, but they floated their goods back to, uh, you know, to uh, St. Louis in, in those small Mackinac or small barges or however they could get around. And then Chouteau, uh, Chouteau and St. Louis business people in the 1820s and 30s, once the first steamboats were starting to get up the Missouri, maybe as far as Council Bluffs or Omaha, uh, they developed a trading, a fur, uh, a hunting thing uh, group, um, and they were doing a lot of stuff, and they created steamboats, small ones, that were just part of their own business. They weren't for passengers or anything else, although a few people went out using them. This is what Fort Benton looked like in the 1830s. Fort Union was another fort uh, downriver, and this is an, these are photographic or drawing examples of the Chateau and company boats in the 18, 1830s. And they were generally side wheelers, uh, and, and very few stern wheelers, and primarily because side wheelers were much more maneuverable than 
the steering wheel boats because they kind of like caterpillar tractors or bobcats today, if you know what those little bobcat uh, uh, equipment is like. Uh, they can turn on the dime, well, because they can get the wheel on one side one direction and the wheel on the other side going the other direction. It's basically two different uh, engines uh, running those, those paddle wheels. It was treacherous. Uh, the Missouri was, was treacherous. The, the, uh, it, the water went up and down uh, uh, often. Every time they would they'd call, uh, you know, a rise in the river. Uh, it, was, it was fast, fast moving. It's fast moving today when I we drove across the bridge and looked down, even though it's a lot wider uh, here. Uh, it still moves very, very, very fast. Uh, and, uh, and logs and trees that, that got into the river were, you know, created this snags that, that, uh, that made it very difficult for boats to go upriver. And downriver, it was as easily uh, very difficult because they had to do a lot of backing and slowing to try to make it through uh, those kinds of conditions. Okay, this is a, a, a view of Cairo and uh, the Forty, uh, and you can see that the boats that are that are depicted at, at Cairo were very similar to some of the earlier side wheels, only a little more advanced. Uh, two deck pilot house. Uh, uh, the stacks were were uh, way up in the front of the boat. Eighteen. Oh, uh, this is a picture of St. Louis in the 1860s. But what I wanted to point out here is by 1839, the arrivals at St. Louis, 1839, 1,400 boats arrived in St. Louis, bringing 213,000 plus tons of, of cargo. Uh, 1840, it went from 14 to 1,700 arrivals, even more tonnage. 1841, 2,100 arrivals. So St. Louis was really, the place to be. Downriver, of, uh, starting at Pittsburgh, going down to Cincinnati, going to Louisville, those were the last big, big cities uh, that, you, that you had on the Ohio. So the next big city and in, in the place that, where people made decisions about where they were going to settle was St. Louis. This is a, a view of St. Louis in, in 1845 really a developing city. This is a steamboat, Missouri, uh, in 1845. Remember, we didn't have cameras yet. You know, about 1850 is when we started getting our first photographs. This is a messenger coming down the Ohio. It had, uh, it had Charles Dickens on it, uh, Jenny Lind. Uh, some, you know, this is the way uh, not only regular people got around, but, but the important people that uh, you know, most people around the country knew about. This is uh, Cincinnati Wharf. This is the first photograph that, that anybody has found of a steamboat, um, uh, and this is at, at Cincinnati. As Mason, I found this uh, photo in the Courthouse Museum in Vicksburg, Mississippi. That was the 1850s. And, and you, you think about you know, the Civil War, the photographer Matthew Brady was just at the really beginning of, of uh, commercial photography. This is another uh, steamboat called the Darling, the Mrs. Memphis and Cincinnati Packet Company. Um, it says uh, possibly uh, the unknown location, but I've spent a lot of time at Cairo, and this has a very strong Carol kind of sense about it, uh, but it may be further down the Mississippi. This is a drawing of the packet boat St. Maggie that, uh, from a sketchbook in 1851. This is up on the Missouri River, and it's a beautiful little sketch, but it also has another part of the sketch up at the top is called a bull boat, which is what uh, hunters as well as uh, Native Americans used 
which was made with uh, uh, small, uh, very flexible branches and then uh, covered with, with a hide. It was just kind of like a bowl. You just get in a bowl and put your stuff in it and, and, uh, and a stick and you go down the river. There's a really nice example of that. I'm waiting for this slide to change. Uh, in the uh, uh, museum at the, at the Arch in St. Louis. Okay, this is a boat that probably a lot of you are familiar with. This is, there's a delay in this and I'm not figuring it out. Uh, this is the Arabia. Which, uh, which many of you, from, if you're in the Kansas City area, have maybe seen this museum of the Arabia. But this is a beautiful painting by Gary Lucy, uh, who's probably familiar with a lot of you all. This is 1853 on the Missouri. This is a Keokuk, which is a Metropolis-built boat. The first boat ever that we've ever figured out was built out of 65 boats. This is the first one. Um, there's a picture of this at uh, a number of different uh, 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 research centers. This is uh, Cincinnati. Uh, 18, well, I'm going the wrong way here. Cave and Rock on the Ohio, 1856. So this is right at that point when, uh, when uh, uh, photography is about to start. So the Arabia, and they, uh, just a few years later, uh, 1856, uh, sank, uh, hit, a, hit a snag. You can see the snag here. This is another beautiful Lucy uh, painting. Oh, it's a different painter. I thought that was Gary Lucy. Anyhow, uh, this, this boat uh, sank uh, above uh, upriver of, uh, of uh, Kansas City. And some, some fellows, uh, Greg Hawley and, and, uh, and his partner in the, in the heating ventilating business, uh, were interested in river stuff. And they'd heard from a farmer that there was a smokestack sticking out of his cornfield. And, uh, and it was about a half a mile or so from the, the middle of the Missouri River at that time when they found it. And they managed to get the funds together to dig that up and, uh, and recover the materials from that boat. And, and conserve them. And I got together with uh, conservation people who knew uh, dry ice, how to, mute, how to remove moisture uh, from the materials, how to clean the mud and the rust off. And they've got a tremendous display of, of uh, materials that were found on that boat. And I put these pictures here probably to, you know, probably to say the purpose of these boats was commerce. Uh, the purpose of these boats was to get from one place to the other for people, as well as to get things that people needed somewhere else to them. So everything on this boat was consigned to some dry goods store, hardware store, or some small town somewhere on the Missouri River. And there was lots of boats carrying this kind, this kind of thing. So when you look at the materials that were on the boat, it's just all the regular, common, everyday stuff. Tools, clothing, uh, uh, agricultural implements and equipment, carpentry implements, equipment, um, pipes, sewing, uh, clothing. Now, some of these pictures are also from the, the, a similar uh, museum uh, or uh, facility related to the uh, steamboat Bear Trend. Which was uh, which sank up near just near Omaha, just south of Omaha in Missouri. And the Arabia Museum is a wonderful display, and many of you have probably seen this. But this is showing the path of the Missouri River and all its other configurations, depending on what the year was and what the flood was, and when it created this horseshoe bend and broke through this location that created a new channel and locates all the steamboat wrecks that, that are out there somewhere or what may remain of them. Uh, and this is just a short distance on the river just to kind of give a feeling. This is St. Charles over here and uh, where we Astoria. Uh, I'm not familiar with those towns. Here's the Twilight, another boat that I've, I've seen all the artifacts from. 
Uh, just to give you a feel, this, this was one channel at one time, that's the channel at a different time. So it's like, kind of like a snake going down and creating new, a new area, more of those kind of. So I really encourage you, if you haven't been to the Steamboat Arabia Museum, I really, if, since you love the river the way I think all of you in here do, or you wouldn't be here tonight. Um, this, is, this is when things changed in, our, in this region for you all. Uh, it was the gold rush, 1858. Uh, gold was, was found in Montana and, and Utah and some other places out west, but Montana was reachable uh, by the Missouri River. And so the first steamboat made it as far as Fort Benton in 1860. Now, an interesting piece of information about Fort Benton is that it's almost 2,500 river miles from St. Louis. 2,500 river miles. St. Louis is about 1,200 miles from New Orleans. So, so Fort Benton became the, the most inland water-reaching commercial port in the world at that time. And these are some of the flyers related to, to Fort Benton, trying to encourage people to go, to live there, to work. I'm waiting for this to change. The Packets to Paradise book is excellent by John Lepley. This is, I can back up one. This is a sketch in 1860 of steamboats ar arriving at Fort Benton. There's the, there's the fort. Uh, this is a, a picture, and actually a, a photograph of that time. This is what Fort Benton really looked like. Uh, wagon trains started at Fort Benton to, to go on to the west. The, the boats couldn't go any further west. And so this is what the waterfront looked like uh, for people who were trying to make their way to the gold fields or, or even over into uh, Seattle area. Now, you probably, many of you have probably seen the really magnificent pictures of the typical big river steamers, especially the ones to New Orleans with, with fancy chandeliers and pianos and a lot of uh, gingerbread. Uh, but this is what it looked like probably on the Missouri River, the center hallway of the second floor, and this is one half of it here, this would be the main kind of parlor. On each side were small rooms uh, with a door here and a door out here that could step out onto a, an open deck, a passageway. And the rooms were about seven foot wide, had two bunks, just big enough for two people to squeeze in there, a, a washstand, a mirror, uh, a place to put put your matches uh, when you were smoking your pipe so that uh, they wouldn't go on the floor and start a fire. And there were uh, windows, uh, clear story windows at the top of the room to let light into that center cabin. And so this is what it basically looked like. And the doors to the rooms, here's one, there's another, 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 another here, same way on this side. So, so they had rooms on both sides, and they, that's where the term state room came from, because they would not necessarily be numbered, they were named after states. Each boat had a, you know, an Alabama room, a Kentucky room, a Missouri room. But for the people who couldn't really afford the state room and the fare to also get food, uh, this is where they were. They were the main deck passengers. And on the main deck, there, there was whatever was being shipped, but on these boats going up the Missouri, a lot of that main deck was cordwood uh, that they needed to fire the furnaces to develop the steam to actually run, uh, run the boats. Interesting story about the difference between the wealthy people living up there and the regular people down here is the story of the woodies and the wood knots. And every you know, 10 miles or so on the river, the boat had to stop and get more wood, had to get more fuel. And the, the mountain boats, the boats that went all the way out to uh, Fort Benton, carried their own uh, hunters, they carried their own uh, uh, carpenters to, to fix and repair the boat, as, as well as to go out and get firewood. 
Uh, and then there were a number of, of, of even Native American groups, as well as Americans, that lived along the river that had wood lots. They, they had, little, had stacks of cords of wood <coughs> along the river, and if they were there, the steamboats could pull up and, and you know, get 20, 30 cords of wood. Or if they even weren't there, they could do it and then leave a note about how much they owed. So there was a really interesting kind of honor system on the river. But when they stopped to load wood, to load wood, uh, if, if you were a, a deck passenger and you would be willing to go on the gangplank or go through the water uh, and, and call wood back to the boat, you were called a woody. And you were treated kind of special. But if you were really too fancy for that and didn't want to get your clothes dirty, they were called wood knots. So they were the folks who would not go help get the wood. Interesting. This is what they, this is at, uh, uh, I think this is at, I can't read where it is, Omaha, it's at Omaha. This is a scene in Omaha with people waiting along the wharf, and it was very much like a, like a bus station. And every, every walk of life, every, you know, race, every uh, level of age, uh, you know, this was the way you got to anywhere. This is a, a steamer at Fort Benton. This is one of the um, typical, this is a side wheel boat. You can tell this, this is a cover over the side wheels. Uh, and the, the side wheel boats had, had a little more room hanging out off the side of the hull on both sides because they were called guards and they kind of helped protect, uh, keep the logs and stuff from running into those uh, side wheel panels, which were very vulnerable. But this is basically what uh, the river's edge looked like. Now, the Ohio River boats had what was called a model bow, a bow, excuse me, uh, which was sharper and more pointed. It was for faster uh, traveling. But because of the, of the problems on the Missouri, they had to create what's called a spoonbill bow on the boat. And it's more shaped like lot smoother, much less pointy on the front, and could go over a gravel bar. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, if you notice that there are two basic derricks or poles on the front of the boat that are attached to cables uh, to the power winch, the steam-powered winch on the boat, that could kind of lean out and, and develop a, the stage or the platform that people could walk from. But they also had another pole right here and one over here attached to the side of the boat. And when they, when these boats could actually crawl across uh, gravel bars. And what, what they did is this pole right here, they would lift that out and then swing it out to, to where it was maybe 20 or 30 feet in front of the boat. Guys would go out and dig a hole, you know, several feet deep, and they would stuff that pole down in that hole, and then they would take ropes from that pole back to their winch and start cranking the winch and drag the boat forward to where those poles were. And then they'd lift them out, swing them out, jam them in the gravel over here, and they would repeat that process. And they could actually drag a boat, and that was called a grasshopper, if you could kind of Picture that, that action with those poles uh, uh, going into the gravel bars. So they were very creative. They, they just didn't have time to get stuck on a gravel bar somewhere and wait for the, the rains to come and the waters to rise. This is how a lot of boats were built at the time, just local guys. Uh, this is uh, at Joplin, Illinois, and here they're building their small little steamboat. This is going to be a stern wheeler, I can tell, because uh, of the shape of the back. The, the, the paddle wheel will be back here instead of on the side. The shape would be different. And it's only probably 40, 50 feet long, and you can see the guys hanging here. And they've got it up on, uh, on kind of a kind of a scaffolding, and you see this round log right here, and another log right here. When they're ready to launch this boat into this creek right here, which runs right back out into the Ohio River, 
uh, they take sledgehammers and can knock these uh, support poles out from under it. It drops down on this log and slides down into the creek right here, and then they can f finish out the upper part of that boat. They need to do that before it gets too big, too heavy, it doesn't have its, its boiler, its furnaces, uh, the steam boilers, and all the, all the, uh, the heavy metal gear on it. Now, thousands of boats were built, and they were not as small as, as that particular one. The boat building business, here's Pittsburgh, here's the Ohio down to Cairo, Mississippi down to New Orleans, St. Louis, up to, up to up the Mississippi, and then out to uh, out the Missouri. This is where the boat building started. Pittsburgh, up on the Monongahela River and the Allegheny River, uh, on the Kanawha River. Uh, and then the, and as technology developed and the skills developed and skill sets developed, it started moving down down the Ohio, but most of the steamboats that you find or ever have found on the, on the Missouri River, unless they were, a few of them were built out here actually, uh, were built over on the Ohio somewhere. Uh, so here is our area for Metropolis and Paducah, what I call the Crescent of the Ohio. This, this is where this is going to get to be important in the relationship to the, to the Missouri River. By 1860, and this is, these are reports from the, uh, from the U.S. Treasury, which uh, kind of kept a record of what was happening on the river at any particular time. In 1817, at that time, even though others had been built, there were only seven active steamboats running. 1820, there were 69, 1823, just a few more, 1830, just a few more. And the United States was going through a depression in that time, 1820s area, era. All of a sudden, by 36, we've got 130, 187, 300, and this is at the time, at that time. This is not the total boats ever built, but this is what was running at the time, 536, 52, 735. So, so, uh, I'm not sure what the actual total is that had been built up to that point, but, uh, but this is what the boat yards, the shipyards look like. And, they, and this is a drawing of uh, the Howard Shipyard in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And a lot of the Missouri River boats were built at this, at this shipyard. A lot more than were built at Metropolis, but Metropolis is still important. So they had two types of what they called ways at, uh, at uh, Jeffersonville. Ways that were perpendicular on rails, and there were cradles that the boat sat on. You'll see a picture in a minute of that. And they could build a boat here, and then it would slide down into the river, parallel to the current. The other way is a, a single way, it's all up and still, it's kind of like a giant version of that Joppa boat, but going down at an angle into the river. And this is all the floated, the logs that were floated down into the sawmills. These places had their own sawmills, or at least a sawmill directly adjacent to it. This particular company, Howard, built out of the 8,700 that were ever built, they built almost 3,000 of those. So this is really quite a shipyard. This is how they were generally built without drawings necessarily. The, the chief uh, carpenter would carve out of a piece of wood, you know, three or four feet long, about 10 or 12 inches wide, and, and five to six, they laminated the wood. He would carve the shape of half of the hull out of that wood, and then draw ink lines every four feet in one direction, every one foot horizontally, and every one foot going down the center of the boat. So they had a three-dimensional version of that boat. And so like right this line right here that went to there to there would be that particular strut, that particular form. The next one four feet over would be that one. trying here.
Can you, could the person in the room hear me where if I said next slide, they could do that? I think that would be helpful. Okay, we'll start with this. So if, it, if you don't mind doing that, I'd appreciate it. This is a, a, a stern view of the boat. The other boat, the other one was the bow view. Uh, this one, because of the kind of uh, shape at the, at the stern, will be a side wheeler because uh, it has a single rudder in the middle. Next slide, please. Now this is a large side wheeler on, on uh, one of those skids that uh, on, uh, it's probably on a, have a set of cradles. But this is under construction. This boat is probably 250 to 300 feet long. And the width at, at the beam uh, with, with the boards here is probably around 40 feet. So it's basically a one, two, three story plus a Texas deck plus the, the pilot house. So it's like a five story building, uh, 250 feet long, 50 foot wide. So uh, that's pretty uh, an amazing piece of carpentry next. Now this is a, a stern wheeler. This is gonna be a stern wheeler in construction on one of those diagonal ways. And you can just see that there's other boats here probably more boats down here. This is what a shipyard looked like in terms of debris and materials. Uh, it's an extremely busy and complex place. A lot of people working. Next. Okay, so so this stretch of river, and, and we're, what I'm getting ready to talk to you is what really made this particular area important. Next. The crescent of the Ohio is here. Cairo is there. Paducah is right there. This is Chicago and the Great Lakes, and this is New Orleans. In 1850, when railroads were starting to be developed, the proposal was from folks in New Orleans just to build a railroad all the way to Chicago. It was this line right here. And it would cross the Ohio in one location. It only had to cross a major river one time, and it would have been at the crescent. That was their drawing. Next slide, please. At that time, uh, 1850, 1860, um, Smithland, Kentucky, which was further up, it was the first kind of community when you come down the Ohio uh, towards Cairo, the first major river you get to is the Cumberland River, which goes to Nashville, Tennessee. And Smithland, Kentucky is right at that intersection at the confluence of the Cumberland with the, with the Tennessee. A lot of boats were built in Nashville that came down the Cumberland. But the first boats in the Crescent region, and 33 of them were built at Smithland. And I've found oh, in our last two days at the Historical Society in Columbia, Columbia that at least half of those boats worked on the Missouri River as early as in the 1820s and 30s. Paducah, Kentucky is the next town downriver uh, that's in within that crescent area. And over the years, they've built 121 steamboats. The next little town is Brookport. Uh, they built none because they were a railroad town. They had a railroad crossing. They built, they manufactured railroad ties for, and there was no room to build any boats. Metropolis, it turned out, near Fort Massac, built 64 boats. Joppa built one that we know of. Mount City built 35. Carroll built 12. Now, these two towns were a major part of the Civil War. And so uh, some of these numbers here, all prior to the beginning of, civil, of the Civil War. Paducah, 16 were built during the Civil War. Metropolis were built, 24 were built in the 60s, 18, uh, uh, 24. Um, anyhow, 18 of those were built between 1861 and 1868, only one in the 1850s. 11 were built at Mount City, three of the ironclads, it was a Navy base, it was primarily a repair facility. Six were built at Cairo, only three during the, during the Civil War, because it was primarily a supply base. Next, please. So this is, a, this is a contemporary picture of Cairo, Illinois. Here's the Ohio River coming into the Mississippi. St. Louis is that way. Pittsburgh is that way. New Orleans is this way. This point called the confluence, and they locally they call it the point, 
is about a mile and a half from downtown Cairo. During the Civil War, this point used to be right here. Probably way back 200 years before that, the river probably came in right here. So this is all built up land based on accretion. E Cairo is completely surrounded by a flood wall and has never flooded since the Civil War. Next slide, please. And this is why it's important. These are maps used during the Civil War by General Grant and Admiral Porter of the river system south. And, there, and most of the maps we're familiar with are all drawn with north at the top. These are drawn with north uh, at the bottom. And this is the south, this is the north. Here's the confluence at Cairo, here's Paducah, Kentucky, and Smithland, and here's this little crescent area. This is Mississippi going up, this is the Ohio going, this is the Tennessee and the Cumberland going south, Mississippi. Here's another map that was done at the same time. Uh, different map, but same orientation. Next slide, please. So if we take this typical drawing, and here's the, the basic north-south Cairo, was further south than most of Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky. So some of the Confederacy was actually north. So Carroll was deep into the south. Here's Vicksburg, very important. Next slide. Same slide turned upside down to match those maps that we saw earlier. So those maps were strategic in the General Grant and Porter understanding how to go down through the south and divide it up using the water. Next slide, please. So here's that map. Here's Metropolis on the Crescent, Paducah, Cairo, Mississippi River, Tennessee, the Cumberland, and the Ohio River. Next. Very, very important. So General Grant and Admiral Porter uh, created this whole idea of these ironclad gunboats. Uh, they built nine of them, uh, three in, uh, at Mount City and six up in uh, Carondelet, Missouri. And this is one of the ironclads being built at Crown de Lay, Missouri, near south of St. Louis, five boilers underneath. So it's a very powerful boat. Um, and these were built by James Eads, who had the contract to build these particular boats. It turns out that Alf Cutting, who became the shipbuilder in Metropolis in the 60s, was working for Alf Cutting I mean, working for James Keyes at the Carondelet shipyard. Next slide. This is a picture of one of the this, one of the large ironclads being built at uh, at Carondelet. Next slide. This is what Cairo at the confluence looked like during that early part of the Civil War, uh, with what they call tin clads. They took regular steamboats, uh, uh, packet boats, and covered them with light metal. But they also built these ironclads. This, this particular boat here is a hospital ship. I think the Red Rover, which is a very important story, a different, totally separate story. Uh, but this is how the confluence of the rivers look. Next slide. Gunboat Mount City, Gunboat Cairo, uh, the Gunboat Cincinnati, three of those were built at Mount City, uh, Ten Clads, this is the hospital ship Red Rover, next. So, at Metropolis during that time, in the 1855, just past the Civil War, built this group of boats, and several of them were built primarily for use on, in the Civil War. Uh, uh, the Bell St. Louis, the city of Cairo, the Victory, um, and, and the Alf Cutting. See, Alf Cutting should have been on there, which is like a, uh, a, a tugboat. They were built specifically for the, the Civil War, use of the Civil War. But they also built the Amanda, the William J. Lewis, the EO Standard, the Antelope, the Ben Johnson, the Waverly Mountaineer, and Utah which were all used going to Fort Benton, going up the Missouri River. And of these boats, uh, several of these also worked the, the Missouri River, but they were typically longer boats and went from St. Louis to New Orleans. They carried the U.S. mail, later carried cotton and stuff. 
And so, so at the, just after, remember the, the gold rush was 1858 starting, this was the prime time of the gold rush. Uh, that's when things were really cooking between Metropolis on the Ohio and uh, as well as Smithland, Kentucky, and Paducah, Kentucky, and Mound City, all in that same area. They all had boats that worked on the Missouri River. Next slide. So here's the Keokuk, the first one built at Metropolis. We saw this earlier. Next slide, please. This is an advertisement for the Cutting and Woods Shipyard. Uh, they used a basic drawing from a Hudson River steamboat because they had an artist rendering they can use, kind of like we do that with our websites, which shouldn't. Next. This is what the Metropolis Shipyard may have looked like. This photograph is from the Howard Shipyard, but it's very, very similar in the sense that Metropolis built some really big, long boats. Next. The people that built the boat, this was Alf Cutting's home, this was Ben Kimball's home, this is Wayne Toll's home. They're still there in Metropolis. Uh, these people are buried in the cemetery. They're, they're obviously still there. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, here's the Keokuk, uh, 1855, 177 feet long, 27 feet wide, had a five foot draft, 220 ton capacity. A ton is basically uh, the, the volume of 100 square feet. So it's about, uh, you know, four and a half by four and a half by four and a half, which would be 100, 100 cubic feet. Uh, not 100 square feet, but 100 cubic feet. So. So the, the, the size of the boat in terms of tonnage was its width, its length, its, its average width, its length, and the depth of storage below deck. And whatever that volume turned out divided by 100 was its tonnage. Next. So this is a list of the Metropolis boats. And there were 26 of them built just in the 1860s. And many of these were built uh, for uh, use on the uh, Missouri River. One of the most famous of those boats is William J. Lewis, uh, but uh, the G.B. Allen, the Mountaineer, uh, the, uh, I can't read it up there, there should be the, uh, oh, the Amanda, the St. Joseph, the Antelope, the Ben Johnson, the Wavery, those were all really important boats on the Missouri River. Next. While we're, while we're waiting, we'll see that there's a few ferry boats being built at that time. Uh, these, a uh, couple of these were uh, used on the, uh, for the Civil War. The Off Cutting was the first propeller tug ever built at Metropolis. It wasn't the, wasn't the technology of uh, building a, a metal, uh, uh, we need to go in the other direction, I'm sorry. about four slides. Let's see if I can do it from here. Oh, yeah. well, that will be at the end here, and shortly. <laughs> I'm sorry. We need to go back about another, well, this, this is okay, the 1870s. No, no, let's go back a few more because I want you to see the pictures of the William J. Lewis. Okay, this is a picture of uh, uh, St. Louis uh, and, the, and the steamboats you see here are just a few, but I've seen the big picture and there's steamboats that another 20 or 30 this way, another 10 or 15 to the right. So this was what it looked like on the harbor. Two of those boats at this particular time were the Mountaineer and the Waverly. Could you go back? This is a view from, of St. Louis. Uh, we're kind of going backwards a little bit, but this, this view is a photograph taken from the Eves Bridge, just completed. Uh, this, this picture is in, uh, the Soto National Wildlife Refuge. Back another slide, please. Uh, this is 
an artist depiction of St. Louis. This is with the uh, Eads Bridge under construction. Uh, this would be called a wharf boat. Uh, these are the kind of boats that were working up on the, on the Missouri. That came from St. Louis. This boat would have been in that harbor that we just saw at St. Louis, and then, then you know, 10 days, 15 days later, this is the scene uh, where it would be back, backwards the slide. Trying to go back. Okay, this is the Waverly, the Mountaineer. Um, um, I'm going to go back two slides and come forward. I apologize. Okay, this is the William J. Lewis um, that, that I found so many pictures of and stories about. And this boat reportedly went to uh, Fort Benton twice in one season, which is very unusual. Uh, and it was in 1866. Now, uh, I went to Fort Benton and where there are really experts. And, oh, okay, I'm getting the... I'm getting a, a thing here. Uh, that said, it didn't really um, go to Fort Ben uh, uh, twice in one year, but it probably went close. Probably got as far as Fort Union. These are examples of that picture. Um, there's a lot of anecdotes about what it was like uh, dealing with the, with the Indians, dealing with other boats that went along to help uh, protect, uh, dealing with buffalo crossing the river. Uh, let's, Let's, uh, oh, I've gone way too long. Let's uh, go f just really quick, go through these. I'll get to them. So uh, boats that, that built Metropolis carried a lot of cotton. Uh, they were mail boats. They obviously went up on the Missouri. Railroads pretty much was the end of, uh, of the steamboat trade. Uh, Missouri Pacific advertising bridges across the river, the river de uh, railroads developing, uh, built steamboats to actually carry uh, boats across the river, like this one that was built in Metropolis. So I'm gonna I'm gonna flip through and end it here, uh, and. Uh, this is, uh, I'll hang around if anybody wants to see some of these. I'll just stop here, I can't get to, I can't get to the thing you <laughs> So, uh, I guess that's, I think that's it for the moment. I think I've, uh, I've got too many slides. They asked me to cut down on the number of slides and I tried. <laughs> so, I think that's it. You want to turn up the lights a little bit? Okay.